Uh, Rahul, I think we can start now. Yeah. Uh, okay, first sure. of all, uh, thanks all for joining the first online lecture at AppCare IEEE AI Symposium. So good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce you today, one of the brilliant minds shaping the future of machine learning in software engineering and AI. So our distinct author for this session is Rahul. So let me share the screen. So Rahul is a fifth year PhD candidate at North Carolina State University, specializing in machine learning for software engineering. His research focus on building better, fast, faster, deep learning models for software analytics tasks. Rahul has uh, actively contributed to the software engineering literature through publication at premier venues, including IEEE transaction on software engineering, empirical software engineering, and expert systems with applications. So please join me in welcoming Rahul. So if you have uh, any doubts and questions, we can keep it at, at the last. So you can raise the hand and we will unmute you. So Rahul, you can uh, share your uh, screen and uh, start the presentation. Yeah, hey Rahul. Uh, Rahul, I mean, with your permission, can we record the talk? Oh, sure. Yeah. So Shrini, you can go ahead and record the talk. Yes, sir. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'll be talking about how to improve deep learning performance using theoretical machine learning. Um, so as a little brief, um, I'm a fifth year PhD candidate. Uh, my research interests are applying theory, theoretical ML to apply uh, ML tasks and machine learning for software engineering. Uh, in the past couple of years, I've worked on several state-of-the-art um, methods for defect prediction, issue lifetime prediction, and more. Uh, we will be touching on all of these at the end towards the results section. Uh, there are broad overarching themes that we will be discussing. Uh, the thesis statement that I want to convey to you today is that theoretical ML results can and should help inform applied researchers to design their algorithms and help contextualize their results. So when things work, why are they working? When things don't work, why are they not working? So this is how we'll be proceeding. We'll talk about the great divide between theoretical and applied uh, ML. And then I'll walk you through how uh, in my research I've used theory to inform applied ML and make choices. At the end, we'll put it all together towards one approach and look at some results and then we'll wrap up. So the, the opposing viewpoints are as follows. The theoretical ML folks go, well, why does your algorithm work? And can you prove that it'll work for other data sets? Can you prove any guarantees at all? And the applied scientists go, well, why should I care about any of your maths when my algorithm works on my data set? And how do you know your maths is gonna work on real world data sets that have noise and such anyway? It turns out these are two sides of the same coin. Uh, so to the theorists, you might say, well, your theory is based on empirical observations. And if you want any proof, any NeurIPS, ICL, ICML, ICLR papers have motivation sections based on empirical observations. To the applied folks, you'd say your algorithm only works because somebody else proved convergences that maybe you don't care about right now. And a key example is people who use SGD or Atom, and there's tons and tons of work showing convergence guarantees for these two algorithms. Um, of course, most research, whether it is theoretical or applied, has limitations unless you're a special, special group of people. Now, another point of friction is that from the applied perspective, a lot of theoretical papers can be hard to parse. So here's a quote from the UMAP paper. UMAP is a dimensionality reduction algorithm. And they say the theoretical foundations for UMAP are largely based in manifold theory and TDA. Much of the theory is most easily explained in the language of topology and category theory. And most applied scientists don't speak those languages. Um, on the flip side, a lot of ML, applied ML code is either poor quality or it's not open source. Um, of course, code being publicly available on GitHub doesn't make it open source. 
if you want an example, look at the Llama. The code is available on GitHub, but it's not technically open source because the license forbids you from using it. So let's look at how we can use theory to make better choices in applied research. Let's start with the learning algorithm. And if you choose your algorithm simply because it's in scikit-learn, then that's probably a bad idea. Um, you shouldn't be making choices just because they're available to you. Um, so let's look at some theoretical considerations for choosing an algorithm. The primary one is whether your learning algorithm can represent your decision function well at all. There are several tools for this. Um, the primary one is VC dimension, but there are also universal approximation theorems. Uh, we will talk about these. Um, the second one is whether your learning algorithm can learn representations efficiently. In this talk, we'll be focusing on feedforward networks, which are great for tabular data, but you really shouldn't be using feedforward networks for, say, image data. Um, something like convolutional nets or vision transformers learn more efficient representations for these. Um, we also want to look at whether there are any theoretical guarantees on your optimization algorithm like SGD or whether on or your learning algorithm itself. There's tons and tons of work motivating guarantees on feed forward networks, specifically um, on deep, deep ReLU networks. Um, so those are good motivations to use. Now, especially in theoretical papers, but to a lesser extent, even in applied papers, it is important to state any assumptions you're making. Uh, there are two benefits for this. One is that other researchers can test if your theory holds true, if they relax or remove some assumptions, um, which is always a good thing. A second thing is it helps people understand when your framework does and does not work. So let's look at our assumptions here. Um, we'll start with the, the simpler one, which is at the bottom, which is that the loss function is continuous and at least once differentiable. This one's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, any gradient-based optimization algorithm assumes differentiable loss functions. Uh, we do use uh, the Hessian definitions uh, for our approach here, but twice differentiability is not strictly a necessity. Um, you can always use a finite difference approximation. The more strong assumption we make here is that the data set comes from a Polish space. Um, a Polish space is a complete and separable uh, metric space. Now, completeness is pretty obvious. Uh, if, you, if you're going to use any gradient-based optimization algorithm, completeness is necessary uh, because it means any Cauchy sequence converges and it converges in the space. Uh, as a simple example, consider the space C00, which is the set of infinite dimensional sequences uh, with a finite number of zeros. Uh, that's not complete. And you can prove this using by constructing a Cauchy sequence or using the bare category theorem. Uh, you strictly don't speaking don't need separability. We assume it because we make a covering argument in our paper, which we won't cover in our today. But uh, the idea is that we make a covering argument, and when you make a covering argument, you you want to avoid things like measurability issues, whether the space is measurable. Um, so if you assume separability, that gets rid of all of those. So let's start with the motivation for using feed forward networks on tabular data. Uh, the first uh, step is to look at the universal approximation theorem. There are several universal approximation theorems. There is, it's not just one, it's a class of theorems. Uh, we'll be looking at the one from Hornick uh, in his 1991 paper, um, so which says that if psi is an unbounded and non-constant activation function for a neural network, uh, this fancy R of psi represents all the feedforward networks using the activation function psi. It says that's dense in LP of mu for all finite measures mu. Uh, which is just a fancy way of saying if you if you're using a non-constant and unbounded activation function, there exists some feed forward network that can represent any arbitrary decision function to any arbitrary precision. Um, the, 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 now this theorem does tell you that this network exists. It doesn't tell you what that network's hyperparameters are. Um, to help us with that, we have uh, this result from Yoshua Bengio's lab. Um, from 2014 NeurIPS, which uh, derived a lower bound on the piecewise linear regions of a feedforward network's decision boundary. Um, we've known for a long time that the reason ReLU networks work as well as they do is because they form sort of piecewise linear regions. Uh, this paper derived the lower bound. The upper bound is a trivial 2 to the n. Uh, this is a lower bound. This is very useful because we have an ni over n zero term with a floor. Um, which means that if any ni is the number of layers at layer i and zero is the number of input units, 
uh, which means that at, at any of the hidden layers, if your number of units is less than or equal to the number of inputs, this lower bound collapses. That doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a bad decision boundary, but it does mean you're not guaranteed a complex decision boundary, which is what you might want. We've also talked about VC dimension for a little bit, and there are a couple of papers very recently, uh, I believe both of these are ICML papers, which derive the VC dimension for deep value networks. One derived it in, the, in terms of the number of weights and the number of layers. The other one derived it in terms of number of weights and number of units, uh, which is, and you can pick whichever is convenient for you. Uh, there's tons of work on SGD, uh, so I won't talk too much about that. There's lots and lots of research showing that if your function is smooth and strongly convex, SGD converges exponentially fast to an epsilon ball of your optima. Um, there is lots of more research showing that it works best with adaptive learning rates. Uh, Dr. Saha and I worked on that in 2021. Um, so we won't touch on that as much. Um, but more recently, there has been some physics-inspired work showing that uh, SGD works particularly well for the non-convex setting. And there are a couple of reasons why. Um, in the non-convex setting, this, this paper by Bray and Dean in physical review letters in 2007 showed that in the non-convex loss landscape, the local minima are not really your problem. Uh, in fact, the saddle points are exponentially more likely. Moreover, for uh, first order gradient methods like SGD, the saddle points are actually, uh, the SGD dynamics repel from saddle points. But if you use a quasi Newtonian method, which is a second order method, those dynamics actually attract towards saddle points, which is why they don't work as well in the non-convex setting. And so SGD works very well for both these reasons, uh, both because local minima are not really as bad as you might think, but also because saddle points are repellers. Um, SGD can also escape from low loss and sharp minima. Um, so assuming uh, at some, at some uh, local minima, if you have the, if the minima is sharp enough measured by the Frobenius norm of the Hessian, uh, then SGD can escape from it exponentially fast. And this was published at ICML last year. Uh, coming to Adam, it's, it's convergence guarantees has, have been studied more recently uh, relative to SGD. Uh, this paper by Redi in 2019 showed that for any uh, beta one and beta two, which are parameters of Adam, uh, such that beta one less than squared beta two, there exists some data set for which Adam diverges, which is always a bad thing. Uh, and that has prompted a lot of discussion on Adam's convergence. And so these two uh, papers have shown that Adam can converge under some settings. It just turns out that with the default hyperparameters, Adam does not necessarily converge. And so we've talked about hyperparameter op uh, in the previous slide. So let's motivate hyperparameter optimization like so. Um, on the top, you'll see um, a bunch of learners on the x-axis on some data set. And the blue dots are the results before tuning and the red lines, uh, red, the red error bars are the performance scores after tuning. Um, and you'll see on the bottom left is C5.0, which is one of the worst performers before tuning, but after uh, hyperparameter optimization, it performs best among all the learners. Um, so this study in 2020 noted that it's misleading, it can be misleading to report conclusions from untuned learners since those conclusions can be drastically changed when you perform hyperparameter optimization. Now, a lot of prior work is based on Bayesian optimization. Um, there's, uh, there's Bergstra and Bengio's uh, paper, which proposed TPE. There's Faulkner's paper, which proposed BOHP. There's tons of methods. Uh, there are other non-Bayesian optimization methods. There's Agarwal et al.'s paper from 2021, which is a taboo search method. Uh, Lee et al.'s paper is just hyperband, which, is, which uses something called successive popping. And so, Let's motivate a better approach for HPO. Um, and a key problem with the methods that we've discussed in the previous slide, the Bayesian optimization methods, are that they're extremely slow at times. Um, even if you, even with 30 evaluations of different configurations, that can be extremely slow. Um, I've had people ask me, well, what about transformer methods? Well, of course, HPO doesn't work very well with transformers. Because if your single model takes days to train, then you don't have the luxury of time to, to run HPO on that, which means, which converts your runtime from days to months. 
Um, and so we need a faster and a better way of doing that. And so one of our motivations is to, to draw on prior work, which, sh which shows that flat minima can generalize much better. There, there's extensive work on this, and we've observed this in our paper as well. So on the left, you'll see some, fl some flat minima. It turns out that this flatter minima has a lower um, strong convexity, and we'll talk about how we derive that. Uh, in the middle, you'll see a sharper loss landscape, which has a much, much higher strong convexity. And on the right, you'll see the generalization errors on this in the second and the fourth columns. Um, you'll see the generalization error is much, much lower for the one with the flat minima, which means it performs better on the test set, even though it performs worse on the training set. And so we're going to use this as our motivation. So since strong convexity is directly related to the sharpness and we want flatter minima, if we minimize the strong convexity, that's all we need to do to find a good hyperparameter configuration. There is another method though. Um, this comes from a paper from the software engineering literature. Um, in 2018, there was a paper showing that batch normalization works because it's because of a different reason than previously thought. When batch normalization was initially introduced, the authors proposed that it works because of reducing what's what they call internal covariate shift. In 2018, this ICML paper showed that even if you have arbitrarily high internal covariate shift, batch normalization can still perform extremely well. And so they show that the reason batch normalization actually works is because it smoothens out the last loss landscape. It makes the beta smoothness lower. And so we use that as motivation um, and asked, well, can we just directly optimize for the smoothness of the loss landscape instead in a random fashion? And so this leads to two methods of HPO. One is based on strong convexity and one is based on smoothness. Um, both of these work in mini batch fashions. So for each hyperparameter configuration from the space of options, uh, you can either pick the highest, the supermum over all the mini batches of the strong convexity. You need to pick the supermum because if you pick the infimum, you get zero, which is uh, a trivial lower bound. So you do need to, min you need to minimize the upper bound. So you need to find the lower up, the least upper bound. The smoothness based one is a little, interesting because we don't find we don't minimize smoothness we actually aim to maximize the smoothness across all this space of hyperparameters and we found that this actually works surprisingly well and intuitively it might seem like maximizing the smoothness would lead to very sharp uh, minima but in, in practice what we found is it leads to situations like the right side where you have these sharp corners of very wide and flat minima uh, we found this to be repeatedly true across multiple data sets. Um, I believe this one is from the MNIST data set. Um, and so we use that as motivation. And so our working theory for why this happens is from this paper also by Yoshua Benjio's lab in 2017, which basically showed that um, for any feed forward ReLU network, there exists an isomorphism to a lower smoothness network. And we conjecture right now that this is why the smoothness-based HPO works. Now, a lot of applied data sets also have the issue of class imbalance. Um, and so in, in most cases, standard oversampling methods such as SMOT from way back in 2002 or even random oversampling are completely fine, but sometimes they're not enough. And at that point, you have to wonder why they don't work. And so we have two hypotheses for this. The first one's the sort of easier problem, which is that minority samples don't contribute enough to the loss function. Uh, you'll recall that neural networks are based on minimizing a loss function. So if you have a minority sample, if they're not gonna contribute as much as the majority class to the loss function. The second is a deeper and harder problem to solve, which is that minority samples don't contribute enough to the loss function for large margin decision boundaries. So in our work, we've found that Sometimes, even if you if the network does find a decision boundary, that decision boundary is extremely small margin, which means that test samples can be can fall on the wrong side of the decision boundary. Now, problem one is extremely easy to solve. Any oversampling method, smote, random oversampling, or even a weighted loss is completely fine. That completely eliminates problem one. Problem two is the more intricate problem. And so we have to oversample in a way that forces the boundary to move away from these minority samples. And so in 2021, we proposed something called fuzzy sampling, which concentrically goes around each minority sample and adds an exponentially decaying number of samples at each concentric layer. Um, and this, now this is different from other oversampling approaches in that while other oversampling methods like SMOTE 
will balance out your classes. Fuzzy sampling actually re reverses your class imbalance. So what was your minority class ends up becoming your majority class now. Um, and so what we've done, what we did in that paper was to use SMOTE after fuzzy sampling. Now this is problematic because although it works extremely well, this means that your data set essentially triples in size. Um, in the paper, we found that if you do fuzzy sampling twice, so once for each class and then use SMOTE to balance out the end, which does result in 10 times the data set size, you get extremely good results um, to the point where we tripled our F1 score from 30% to 90%. Um, and so this is kind of an intuition for why fuzzy sampling works. On the left, we, we've created essentially two balanced classes, but for the sake of demonstration, we're gonna treat the yellow class as the minority class. So with one round of fuzzy sampling, you get what the middle diagram. And so you see this new layer of points around each minority class. Uh, we don't actually care if these new pseudo points are misclassified because they're not the ones we care about. We just want to make sure they influence the decision boundary to move away. Now, of course, if you do this twice and then apply smoke, you get the one on the right, which leads to extremely large decision boundaries, sorry, extremely large margin decision boundaries with respect to the original training samples, which is what we aim for. Another surprising side effect we found in a 2023 paper was that Applying this also, for some reason, leads to flat minima, um, flat minima that had higher smoothness, um, which also motivated our approach to maximize the smoothness instead. So let's put it all together. We've talked about learning algorithms, we've talked about optimization choices, we've talked about hyperparameter optimization, and we've talked about class imbalance. Um, so when we put it all together, uh, we're gonna talk about these tasks. Um, so for a quick introduction, uh, defect prediction is the problem of given a given multiple Java files in say a Java project, can you assist the developer in maybe pointing out what files are more likely to be buggy? Um, this is especially important in large projects like Google where test suites can potentially take, take weeks to run. And so it's prudent that you, you make sure you find the bugs before you actually submit your uh, commit to continuous integration. The uh, the problem of issue of lifetime prediction is more for end users. Um, given metadata about issues raised on Bugzilla for projects like Chromium or Firefox, uh, can you predict how long they'll take? Um, we converted this from a regression problem to a classification problems, mostly because prior work did that and we wanted to compare against the state of the art. Uh, code smell detection is very similar. Uh, given some code, uh, given attributes that you can extract from these static code attributes, can you detect whether there's code smells? Um, are there God classes? Are there extremely large functions that do think multiple things that they shouldn't? Um, the fourth one's a little more intricate. Um, there are static code analysis tools like find bugs that are actively used in uh, big tech companies. The problem is that these static code analysis tools have very, a large number of false alarms. To the point where developers actually ignore all the warnings raised by these static code analysis tools. And so they, although they're in the CI pipeline, they're not really useful at all. And so there was, there was a line of work which, um, which uh, attempted to detect false alarms raised by these static code analysis tools. Um, and so in 2023, we uh, collaborated with some researchers at Singapore Management University to make to check if we can improve that. And we, we achieved state of the art results there. Uh, we also looked at standard ML data sets. Uh, these are data sets from UCI, data sets that were used at the 2020 NeurIPS Black Box Optimization Challenge, uh, and more data sets that, that were used in, op, in OpenML. Um, OpenML is a set of data sets from which HPO Bench, which is a benchmarking tool for HPO methods, uh, draws its data sets from. And so here's our overall approach given all the, the theory that we've built up. So we'll, we'll use feed forward networks with a reduced hyperparameter space, thanks to the results by Montefar, uh, which showed that we need at least a number of input layers in each hidden unit, in each hidden layer. Uh, we'll use Atom because there are now convergence guarantees for it. For HPO method, uh, prior to 2023, we didn't have these newer methods. So we relied on something called Dodge, which is a taboo search based method, it's extremely fast. Um, for oversampling, we use fuzzy sampling as well as smote. Uh, we didn't talk quite about uh, label smoothing. Smoothing is a semi-supervised learning approach 
even if you have all the label labels, the way label smoothing works is it builds a KDE tree of all the samples and at the leaf clusters, it, it assigns all the samples, the mode of the class in that leaf. Uh, we found this necessary because in the static code warnings case, we found that the labels couldn't be trusted. Um, so on the SC tests, we are uh, compared to state of the art and we generally did pretty well, as you can see. Um, the, the wins are if we are statistically significantly better than the prior state of the art. If we are statistically significantly the same rank uh, as measured by uh, either a Scott Knott test or a Crisco Wallace test, uh, we mark it as a tie, otherwise we mark it as a loss. And so overall we're doing pretty well. So the natural question is, well, what if you applied other HPO methods? Um, and so we did that next. We compared to random as a very simple baseline, but we also compared to BOHP, which is Bayesian optimization combined with hyperband. And so we declare something as winning if it outperforms both, we declare it if it ties with any of the others, and otherwise we declare a loss. Now, although a lot of these seem like we have ties, this is still completely fine because our method is three times faster than all other methods. While uh, an approach like BOHP needs 30 evaluations to find an optimal configuration, uh, our approach needs about five evaluations. We did the same thing with non-SE res uh, results. Uh, we compared to five other HPO methods. This was work with Dr. Saha. Um, so we compared to TTE, which is uh, Berkshire and Bengio. We compared to random search, uh, Turbo. Uh, Turbo is a method that builds a smaller model to predict the performance of a configuration. If it predicts the performance is bad, instead of running the configuration, it updates based on optimization with this predicted performance. So it's incredibly fast. Um, in our testing, Turbo was actually the second fastest after our method. Uh, there's also Hebo, which, um, which challenges interesting issues in HPO, such as heteroscedasticity. Uh, and there's, of course, BOHB, which is the state of the art. And so we declare an algorithm as winning if it outperforms all the other algorithms. And so we don't really expect any of these to win, uh, but we do uh, expect lots of ties, which is, does it tie with any of the other algorithms? And so while most of the other algorithms are tying, and even ours is tying a majority of the time, we do have one when this was on the wine data set. Um, and of course, we're still yes, about to yes, okay. Um, so let's wrap up now. Um, so we did cover a lot of ground. Um, so we talked about why theory matters. We talked about why applied researchers should care about theory. Uh, we made an algorithm based on uh, theory, and we tested uh, on 271 data sets. Now, a natural question here is, what if my theory back solution doesn't work? I, I, I read all this theory, I, I did all this math, and I, my, my algorithm still doesn't work. There's a couple of reasons. One is you should look closely at assumptions. Um, it, it could be that your assumptions used in the algorithms don't hold for your data set or for your specific use case. A second um, possibility is that there's a newer theoretical paper that refutes the older paper. This has happened countless times, especially with Adam. Um, so it's important to make sure you're reading the newest papers that make that have everything up to date. Um, and finally, just try something else. Applied ML is sometimes uh, a bit of art um, on top of science. Now, I think we're a bit ahead of time. So if anyone has questions or comments, um, the floor is open. Uh, Shantanu, uh, sir, you can, yeah. Yes. Um, so, I have two questions. One is that um, I just want to understand uh, what you did with the taboo search. Um, oh, right. Um, sure. So, taboo search has this premise. Um, it looks, it, Taboo search starts off in a in the same way as random search. It looks at random configurations. Oh, the only uh, difference uh, is that no, no, no. If, I, I mean, I I understand what is taboo search. I'm saying, what did you do with taboo search? Oh, we use taboo search as the method for our HPO. Um, so there is an algorithm called Dodge, um, which we didn't talk mm -hmm. about here. Um, but Dodge is this algorithm from our research lab, which uses taboo search to as a hyperparameter optimization method. So it's incredibly fast as well. Oh, okay. So you uh, basically taboo being you know like many heuristic search. So you are uh, doing the search. Uh, you are doing the search to find out the optimal uh, 
Uh, oh, I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, because I, I used Taboo Search a long time back on finding out the most optimal uh, layer in a, in a software organization. So, uh, so which is why I was a bit, you know, like interested to know what, what they do do here. Um, we we did uh, find that uh, taboo search doesn't work well for non SE data sets. Um, we found that that's because non SE data sets have a much higher intrinsic dimensionality, um, but SE data sets have a lower intrinsic dimensionality. So we found that for these simpler data sets, taboo search works extremely well, but it does poorly on the non SE data sets like MNIST, for example. Right. I mean, I, I tried taboo search on software engineering data sets or actually, uh, actually uh, on, on a by extracting the software structures and then forming that as a, you know, like dependency graph on that, I tried to use the, the most optimal layers. Um, yeah, so but that's long time ago. Uh, but my my second uh, it's not a question, but you wanted to know, you said that you work with um, SMU. So which group did you work with? Is it David Lowe's group? Yeah, this is David Lowe's group. Um, ah, came in okay. one of his PhD students, yeah. So what, what did you do with David Lowe? Uh, so his his group actually refuted one of our earlier papers. So uh, our group in 2021 or 2022, I don't remember, published one paper on static code false alarm detection. Um, hmm. It turns out that, that the data set that they used um, had some air issues. There was some leakage from the training set in the test set. Some of the features were, I, I think, redundant. And so the David Lowe's paper published um, in TSC saying that this data set is actually bad. And so the only reason your method works is because the data set has all these flaws. Um, and so we collaborated with them to, to fix these issues. So what they did was they manually hand labeled uh, a subset of the data set. And so now we work with them to build a better solution for that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there any other questions? Well, I, I have a few more. I, I thought, uh, other oh, sure. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, when you were working uh, on this, uh, you know, lifetime prediction, what exactly is that? What exactly uh, so, is that lifetime? Uh, so um, this is the the difference between when a Bugzilla issue was closed and when it was opened. Um, so we we tested this on Firefox. Oh, issue lifetime. Uh, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah issue lifetime. Um, so, so what did you do there? I mean, um, what exactly did you do? Uh, so, uh, for so the idea is that for both stakeholders of the project, there are there is some benefit in understanding whether uh, an issue that you raised, whether it's on Bugzilla or GitHub, will be closed quickly or not. Um, mm. And so the idea is to predict that. Um, and prior work did this in a variety of ways, but they essentially binned it down into I think five classes. Um, and so we we all we followed their, their footsteps to compare against them. Hmm. Okay. The other two I kind of um, I could guess uh, the you know you know defect prediction or port smell uh, mm -hmm. I could actually guess. Um, but I mean, uh, well on, on the port smell, let me ask uh, something or uh, maybe to just sure. check if my guess is correct or not. So on that code smell. Oh, sorry. I think your audio. Uh, sir, your voice is not audible. There we go. Shantanu sir. Um, this might be a thing. Okay, I think he's having connection issues. Yes. So is there anyone else who? Want to ask certain questions? Um, if not, we can wrap it up early. Uh, my email is in the first slide over here. Um, I will be graduating in a few months, so my university email ID may, may not work after that. Um, so I encourage you to email me at this address instead. Okay. So, Rahul, one more thing. Is it okay if we share this recording on YouTube? 
course, yeah. Yeah, thanks Rahul. I think uh, there is no more questions. So thanks for accepting our invitation right. and giving the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.